Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Jerry Wallach, my partner in crime, Vasily Gianna Rocco's my friend. How are you? What's going on, buddy? Uh, could be doing better after the results last night, Yuri. Okay, I mean, we okay. all kind of know what's happened here. Um, the Chicago Blackhawks getting that first overall pick. And we're going to run through it all, uh, meaning the Flyers stay at number seven. So obviously we could be better in light of that news, but we're going to break it all down for everybody. And we got a great guest and a great episode ahead. So excited. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to talk today as well. And you mentioned our guest. Back to the show. Uh, the, I guess, the... I don't know, operator of high and wide. I feel like you are high and wide uh, in a lot that. of ways, dude. I like, I just feel that when I think of high and wide, I definitely think of you, uh, Jim Icavoni. I really, I know we've gone this like 50 times. Okay, cool. I remembered well. Um, my friend, welcome back to the show. That was a horrible intro. How you doing? That's <laughs> all right. What's going on guys? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm uh, dude. Really glad to have you on. Uh, I've actually I've listened to your show a little bit over the past few days. It's not you guys have good content, man. I, th- I just listened to one with Russ Cohen. Um, for those who have not checked it out, definitely go check them out. High and wide, um, is it high and wide uh, radio, hockey or, radio. High, yeah, either. Yeah. Either if you um, want to search for it on podcast, I think it's still high and wide radio. But uh, yeah, the site's hwhockey.net. So yeah, kind of going with both. You can't go wrong. Yeah. Uh, awesome uh definitely check it out they have I, what i like about your show is it's very similar to ours and that you like to just kick it and talk about hockey and mm-hmm. i've had you know you've called me on your show a few times i remember even when i joined it's just like you even had like this one show where you just rotated people in You're just like hey join us to talk about the flyers join us to talk about the flyers i just love that and we try yeah, to stick just, to only hockey here for the most yeah part. man just yeah you just gotta have fun with it you know it's uh it's kind of a thing where you can do whatever you want there's there's no rules and i think that's what's most appealing to me about all this stuff is so there's true. no rules you know as soon as you start putting rules in place things kind of just get boring i think so yeah. it's it's I try to have fun yeah it's true we can do whatever we want you know what i mean yeah. like i yeah. remember when i was a kid i would have killed for podcast content on the flyers you know what i mean yeah. I'd, have to, I'd reread the same blog 50 times it's like <laughs> the only thing you had Right, everyone's um, talking about the same stuff because we all read the same article or we all yeah, watched exactly. the same show, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's definitely better. Um, so, okay, so we got a bunch of topics today. We'll talk about uh, the Hawks and their luck. We'll talk about the Flyers getting the seventh. Uh, we'll talk about, um, you know, some, you know, what are the options for the draft, whether players or picks. Um, we'll talk about uh, some of the IIHF worlds that are upcoming, some players named there and some recent unfortunate news uh and then we'll talk about uh you know a little bit of the president of hockey operations and um that being imminent and then you know we'll end up with some playoff talk and just kind of our thoughts here of the second round it's getting uh unpredictable and i like that um all right let's get into it so last night obviously the lottery draft uh was out and about uh everybody was excited don't lie. You all were sitting there praying to hockey gods of whatever religion or thought you want to talk to. You were wishing. You were praying. Um, even if you were negative about it, you still in the back of your mind maybe were thinking like, I hope I'm wrong. You know, everybody wanted this kid. And the team that I would say, at least the teams that deserved it and being one of the bottom end teams, this was the least fun one for the league. You know what I mean? Like, it's a team that's had championships. It's a team that had success, but also a lot of controversy as well. And then uh, already trading away players and tanking on purpose, um, which, again, you know, can work. And in this case, completely paid off. Jim, I'll go to you first. Um, The Blackhawks get Bedard. What's going through your mind? I don't know that I... You know what I found funny is a lot of the people who are typically anti-conspiracy theorist all of a sudden turned into conspiracy theorists last night when Chicago got that first uh, overall pick. I really didn't think much of it. Um, I guess if you want to get conspiracy, whatever, it's okay. Yeah, the NHL is a business and it would make a lot of sense for Bedard to go to Chicago uh, opposed to Anaheim or Arizona. You know, it's a big hockey market team in the, in the middle of USA uh, everybody knows the Blackhawks original six team. I I don't think I was upset about it as most people. I, I'll be honest. Maybe I'm maybe I'm one of those people that would rather see him with the Blackhawks than 
uh, in Arizona or Anaheim. So I don't really pay much attention to those teams. I'm also happy he didn't end up in the Metro division. So, you know, I think the odds, uh, the chances, I mean, the odds were 6.5% that he was going to go to the Flyers, which was very low. So, you know, I didn't have much hope. Uh, Yesterday was fun, though, because I think everyone, you know, for one last time, it was like, okay, we can maybe get Bedard. Um, But then when they didn't, it was like, eh, you know, when they flipped over that seven, you were kind of like, hey, whatever. That's where they were supposed to pick. What do you guys think? Well said, Vasily. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to close my window here. I got somebody. Uh, playing yeah, me, no worries. Um, I mean, kind of the same sentiments as you. I'd say, Jim. Like in terms of everything being rigged, that's obviously the hot button topic to go around. And you can criticize the broadcast, and I'm going to oh, here. Yeah, I yeah. think you know they didn't really do the best job of presenting it. I thought it was a little bit unorganized. Personally, from the NHL's perspective, I think when you have a draft lottery like this, just to ensure that the fans, you know, suspension of belief um, kind of isn't there, you probably should show the balls drop. Like, we kind of all know this is a made-for-broadcast event. So chances are this draft was done or held, you know, beforehand, and they knew the results, and it's kind of just presenting them on TV. So I think in that sense, right, if you present the balls being dropped and do it that way, you probably get less of a, um, you know, terrible reaction from a lot of the nhl fans thinking oh hey this is rigged because why not show it if you have the opportunity to do so so i think from their perspective that's just you know ball dropped um and they probably should have done it a different way but in terms of it being rigged i mean if you think about it right like all the odds play out exactly how they're supposed to up until the top three and then you have the three teams with the best odds and it kind of switches around so i I don't think it's really much of a surprise that those top three teams are one of the uh you know teams getting bedard Um, In terms of it being Chicago, I just think if you look at the Flyers fan perspective, obviously go back to that Stanley Cup final, losing to Chicago, that's always going to leave a, uh, you know, a bit of a bad taste in Flyers fans mouths, kind of seeing them have more success. And this obviously with this number one pick kind of adds to that. Um, And then I would say too, right, like Anaheim and Columbus um, coming behind them. um, Obviously, Anaheim had the best odds. Um, Columbus... um, you know, I think it's the team that really gets shafted here. If you just look at their organizational history and a team that really deserved the pick probably would be them just based on like the lack of success the organization has had in general. So, um, I mean, for Chicago, am I surprised? Not really, because one of the teams that had the best odds, what have I let, li- would I have liked it to be a different team than them? I, I would have personally liked to see Columbus get it despite them being in the Metro. I just think organizationally, they probably deserve it the most out of all those three teams, Anaheim or Chicago. So, how about you, Yuri? What's your thoughts? Yeah, man, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I have a preference. I guess my thought was just like, get away from me as much as possible at this point, because like I, I wanted you more than any prospect I've ever seen. And I don't, I like especially the past few years, I kind of just been letting go. But this was the one guy where I was like, for the love of all that is holy, please come here. Uh, and obviously he's not. So I'm kind of like, OK, I definitely don't want to deal with him on a regular basis. Like, I just don't want to. It would be entertaining yeah. to watch him, but I can watch him at anywhere I want. So I definitely don't want to deal with him and I don't want him to be in my division. And if he can get away from my conference, like Jim, Jim was saying, like, ideally, it would have been best for me if he went to Anaheim because then I'm like, you can go play in Disney or something like that. You know what I mean? Go to the other world for a little yeah. bit. Um, and the fact that it went to Chicago, I'm like, okay, I... I don't think the NHL wanted it to go to Chicago. I think ideally it's good for them, but you can also make the case that if he went to Arizona, I was telling you Vasily off camera, you know, that's an organization that can't fill a stadium um, that yeah. is not relevant and is on financial. Like that's what I mean. If they're going to rig something, it would have been for well, them. Right. Well, you, you think about it. This is a team that just has not been able to be financial, financially successful. If you want a guarantee of financial success, there you go. Right now the NHL is holding them up. Right. So, you know, you put Bedard on that team. All of a sudden they're relevant for the next 15 years if he stays there. Um, So I don't know. My my thing is that it's definitely not rigged. Um, It's unfortunate from the sense that, you know, the Blackhawks tanked and got rewarded. But this is why you risk tanking. You know what I mean? They almost didn't work out. So for them, I'm sure they're going to be an annoying team for us to watch. They have two first round picks in the early going here. And I'm. Sure, that'll be really annoying because they're going to get really good over the next several years um, if they play their cards right. I don't, I don't know if you guys have anything more to add on just seeing Bedard. Otherwise, we'll go to the seventh pick. No, I'm I, in a way. I'm kind of glad that it's over. 
uh, all no, the hype. I, I'm glad it's over. down. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent agree with that. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad it's done because uh, I feel like for almost two years now, it's all we heard about was Bedard, Bedard, and the way the Flyer season went, you knew that they weren't tanking, and uh, it's season got annoying at times. I, I love, I love discussion and I love conversation, but I just couldn't take it much longer. Yeah. The obsession with the stuff. No, I really, I actually, I'm really glad you said that because the obsession with this draft is, was really annoying. Like even last year's draft. People are like, well, nobody cares about this year's draft because next year's draft yeah, is so much gets more gets overshadowed a bit. But, but notice how when we got to this draft, the criticism of this draft already starts, where it's like, well, they're not actually as good as you thought. Where, you know how <laughs> Mitchikov was a generational player? Well, he's not. He's not really. Uh, right. he, he Actually, he could go at number 10 for all we know. It's just like it, you realize the criticism just ramps up every year anyway. And it just gets – this year, yeah. I wanted it to be over. At like 7 o'clock, I was like, I just want to know. I was like, I don't want to worry about this anymore. Like, let's just get past it. So let's talk about that, actually. So it's a great transition. So we got the seventh overall pick. There are a bunch of names going around. Um, I do want to bring up a couple things just because they were like, obviously, there have been a lot of updates up there. But if you look at Craig Button and Bob McKenzie over the past several years, I think it's a little too early, but they are relatively accurate in the interest, right? Because a, a lot of what Bob McKenzie does in particular, and he says this publicly, it's surveys. He, It's not his opinion. These are surveys of NHL scouts he talks to, and these are the averages of that. And what Bob does, or I'm sorry, what uh, Craig does, Craig Button, he takes it more of a scouting approach, and he gives his opinion from a GM standpoint because he's been a GM, right? So I'll just go through, uh, let me go through Craig's. He's got a top 16 here, and then I'll do Bob's. So he's got number one, he's got Bedard. Two, Fantilli. Three, he has Carlson. Four, Will Smith. Five, Dvorsky. Six, Michikov. Uh, number seven for the Flyers, he has Ryan Leonard. Eight, uh, David Reinbacher. Um, nine, Corey Barlow. Ten, Matthew Wood. Eleven, Alex Sandine Pelika. Pelika, I think that's how you said Pelika. Sandine Pelika. Uh, Arizona, Zach Benson, Buffalo Sabres, Oliver Moore, Brandon Yeager, uh, 14, 15, Gabriel Perot, uh, 16, Nate Danielson. And I've seen very different opinions of this list. Let's just go through Craig's first. What do we think about Ryan Leonard at number seven? I'm pretty sure that's what Bob has too. But what do we think about Ryan Leonard and then some of the names around there? Um, does anybody interest you guys a little bit more? And Jim, we'll go, to, we'll go to you first. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So Ryan Leonard's my guy, I think. Okay. Um, I usually, the last time I had a guy was Tyson Forster. And oddly looking enough. looking good. Yeah. <laughs> he is. <laughs> so uh, this year, I'm like, okay, you know, let me watch some of these games. And uh, I've watched, uh, like everybody else, I'm sure, a lot of these YouTube videos. Elite Prospects is outstanding if, if you are. want to catch up get your prospect stuff uh caught up on and uh luckily enough we had the u18 tournament a couple weeks ago and uh you know that whole line of will smith ryan leonard and uh, uh perot is is so much fun to watch um there's going to be there's going to be a, a bunch of players at seven but i think for me what stands out the most i think ryan leonard in my opinion looks the most pro ready like he has the most pro habits if that makes sense because all of those guys are totally great. and when i watch this kid i'm like he looks like he's playing in the nhl already where some like of the things adult? that didn't he yeah, look like he, an adult to you i'm sorry jim to cut you off yeah, but no, i agree he, with that statement very much he just has like that he plays a game in a mature way i think where he gets back on D, if he turns the puck over he's he's back on d immediately like you don't want to see guys turn the puck over and you know, kind of okay. Now I, I got to get back on D, or they'll wait for someone I'll else get to back, do the work. Exactly right. He goes back and he gets the puck back, which I I look for that kind of stuff because you know that that's a sign of uh, a guy that's not lazy. He takes pride in his game. You know, he takes accountability. There's responsibility there. So those are things that I look for in a prospect: accountability, responsibility. You know, is it or is he going to leave it to someone else to do? And um, he stands out to me as as a guy that has. NHL habits or pro habits already. Whereas I see guys like Will Smith and, you know, I'm sure I'm no prospect expert, but when I watch guys like Will Smith, I'm like, sure, he's got outstanding skill. But when, if I have to compare him to Ryan Leonard, I'm like, Ryan Leonard looks like he's already built for the NHL. Maybe his ceiling is not as high or I'm sorry, his, his floor 
is high, but his ceiling may not be as high as Will Smith's. And I think that's the argument. So in short, sorry for the long answer. Ryan Leonard Great would answer. be my guy at seven if if he's there. It would be hard for me though if if Dvorsky's there at seven. It'd be really hard for me to pick, uh, not to not pick Dvorsky. I I think that was very well said about Ryan Leonard for sure, and uh, hard to disagree with. Vasily, sorry, do you want to comment? And then I'll read off the other ones. Uh, from yeah, Boston. sure. Um, so for seven, I mean, I'll caveat this. Obviously, if Mishkov's around, like that's who you have to take. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case, but we'll see kind of how it all unfolds with the politics of it. I mean, I said last week, even if he's there at seven and never comes over, you still have to take him. Like, it's just malpractice if you don't take a player with that type of, you know, talent and who's arguably could be as good as Bedard. We haven't even seen them face off against each other um, due to kind of all the politics and Russia not being in the World Junior. So, caveat, if Mishkov's there, it, that's my guy. Um, if Dvorsky is around, I'm taking Dvorsky um, just based on... Um, First and foremost, his shot. Um, I, I watched him in the U18, that four goal game. Like the kid has uh, a, a wicked shot um, and just a lot going for him in, in general. Uh, had a great tournament there. And also being a center and, and a big guy is probably something that the Flyers need, um, you know, just in their prospect pool in general. Um, so Dvorsky would be it for me he, if, if he's around. Um, and just, I would say too, like, his um, skill in like battles um, and like being the first to win those battles are a, a big deal for me as well. I think for a prospect, like usually you want a guy that's going to go into battles like that and come out with the puck more often than not. And that's kind of a skill that Dvorsky um, exhibits a lot in his game from what I, I've seen of him. Um, and then if those two aren't available, um, obviously Dvorsky or um Mitchkov there, then I would go with Zach Benson. Um, he's been ripping it up um, with the ice um, in the playoffs so far. Um, obviously, been playing, um, you know, with Matt Savoy, and uh, that's you know been great for his game. But I, I think he uh, would be a really skilled player that the Flyers could find at that you know spot too. So overall, in that range at seven, like there's going to be a, a lot of really skilled players and first line available talents. It's just kind of more of a preference of what the flyer scouts see and what kind of game uh, ready player they're looking for in terms of what you said with Leonard, Jim, I think he's definitely a Tortorella type pick and looks more ready too, Agreed. right? So that's something to kind of factor in. I don't know how much say he's going to have, but it's definitely a possibility. But I, I think that's very well said. And I th Jim, I think you were kind of alluding to that. Like when you were talking about the responsibility, like, I felt like you were kind of, and the reason you were talking about that floor to the ceiling, because you're like, I know this guy will play for Tortorella. And not yeah. only that, he could play early for Tortorella because, you know, the same way you see, like, even, you know, a young Joel Far Faraby was like this, you know, who obviously made the NHL early and so successful. It's like when they just have the little pro details ready at the a young habits, age, right? the habits, the Noah Cates, right? It's like they just, it's easier transition, smoother transition. And that U.S. program, it breeds those guys. So to your point, I, I do see that as well in him. Um, I think it's actually very interesting how low-ranked the U.S. players were until recently. And this is why I wanted to uh, do it kind of spread out. So this is Bob McKenzie's list, right? And this is the one that's more based off of scout rankings. And that's why I find this really interesting. And I'm going to read the previous ranking, which I think is also pretty telling and why I wanted to split it up this way. So obviously, Connor Bedard, the number one, last ranked at one. There's no changes there. Fantilli, two, last ranked two. Number three, Will Smith. There's a big jump, right? Yeah. This is USA's top player. He he goes from number six. Now, that means opinions that he is hearing are trending in this direction where it seems like a lot of these guys were being underestimated, at least on the, the NHL scout stage. Then Leo Carlson goes from three to four. Not, you know, not that surprising. He would only drop one. Then he's got Michikov at five, last at four. Again, taking another drop. I do want to talk about what Vasily said, though, because I think that that's important also. Uh, we have Dvorsky at six, a big jump from nine, where people were like, okay, he's probably going to be available to, ooh, maybe he's not going to be available for the Flyers. You have Ryan Leonard at seven, again, consistent with the other list. Previously at 10, Zach Benson uh Previously at five, now at eight, which is interesting. Then Gabriel Perot, which I was very confused why, but ranked at nine, where previously 23rd. 
That is a huge yeah. jump. But if you look at his numbers, he had what 130 points or something. They're up there with Jack Hughes. And same thing, yeah. uh, not with more with uh Will Smith. Him and Will Smith, their point per game over their uh over the, the past couple of years playing for that program, they're up there with Jack Hughes. That's why I want to I'm very confused about that. Uh number 10, we have David Reinbacher. He was last at 20. So again, big jump from a guy who originally was supposed to be a later first round pick. Corey Barlow, uh, originally at eight, now at 11. Um, somebody that Craig Button is very high on. Uh, Matthew Wood at 12, at 14. So definitely a different list on that one. The first thing I want to talk about is a U.S. born player. So let's talk about Ryan Leonard for a second. Right now, he's being listed as the guy who's going to be available for the Flyers. I think these rankings will shift again. Um, I do find Ryan Leonard really interesting, but for me, I, I want to know if he can play center. And in the case where I'm like, I could choose to be more aggressive in this draft because what I see, if Dvorsky is not available, I really want a puck possession center who, and I, I think Leonard has some of that ability, but not in the same way that uh, Will Smith has it. Or I think Dvorsky, and again, I'm no expert on these guys, but that is a huge thing for me in this draft. We have a guy in, in uh, Cutter Gautier, who's going to be good defensively, offensively, can score. Maybe maybe Ren Leonard's even a better score. That's potential. But I'm just looking at it like I want a play driver, puck possession guy, but also with size and defensive responsibility. So when I hear European, I haven't been able to stop thinking about the fact that I didn't see Miko Rantanen coming. Right. Like I didn't see a 50 goal scorer there when I looked at him. I wanted Provorov. Right. I loved Matthew Barzal at the time. I wanted that. So, like, I'm looking at these European guys with the right combination of size, the fact they're playing against men. It's like, I don't want to underestimate them at all. So, I, right now, divorcing my number one, unless Michikov drops. And I do want to say this. Uh, and Will Smith would be amazing as well. Um, I, I do say this as, as well, though. If Michikov is available, I, I I assume that I am researching the hell out of this. But there is a way that you can get this guy out of there in a reasonable time, maybe a year, even maybe early. Again, I don't know what's possible. One hundred percent from there, this guy is the youngest guy to make the KHL at sixteen years old. He is outpacing Ovechkin. This is what I was saying to Vasily before the call. Like, let's say Adam Fantilli is Nathan McKinnon. Well. Matei Michkov, Alexander Ovechkin. I don't know, but he's outpacing him. You have to give him the credit just on sheer, like, forget the risks about him. Just what he's doing is that high of an impact. I'd have to consider it as my top option if he was available. Um, I'd, I'd do my due diligence if I thought it was really a huge risk and he was never coming over. Still, I had a little waiver on that because I'm like, I'd rather just have a good player than never having a player. But, um, I would, I would definitely, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to pass that up. And I, th I think Dvorsky is my second favorite, but I don't really know. Like, I'm just, I don't want to miss on a European again. Uh, you know, we look at Elias Pettersson. He was not the most renowned player in that draft. And we talked, I talked about this last episode. The guys overseas, they're not going to get the same publicity that the guys over here are going to get. You can see that reflected in these rankings, reflected in the way the media talks about them. They're in love with the home, you know, with the North American guys. And it makes sense. You know, it's that's where our media is. That's where they cover. That's where they see most of them. So, I don't know. That's kind of where my thought is. Um, yeah, any disputes on what I said? I mean, I kind of said a lot there. Nothing for me. I think it's interesting, obviously, the European factor. Like, just, I mean, we've talked about it in past episodes. I do think that there is something to be said there where the media does for, focus more, at least especially um, in Canada, on more Canadian, you know, uh, homegrown players. Same with America, the the U.S. Uh, NTDP obviously gets a lot of the the highlight in terms of prospects and you know who are the big names coming up. So I do think, in a sense, uh, a lot of the European guys can get overshadowed, um, especially uh, with like a Dvorsky, right? Who I mean didn't really make any waves until this upcoming tournament of really cementing himself in this like top five. Where now it's kind of not unanimous, but it's pretty set in stone that he's probably going to go in that range, whereas before he may have not at all. So it just shows, right, how a lot of these guys can be late risers, but it's not really to a fault of their own. It may be because they aren't focused on as much as some of the other players. So it's interesting for sure. 100%. Jim, let me ask you something, because you, you didn't really name your opinion. What do you think about the Mitchkov? And I will say, I've kind of heard your show recently, so I, I did hear the thought of the people on your show. But I, I do want to know, like... You know, where are you with Mitch Kov? Like, in your mind, is he a guy that you have to take a risk on? 
Um, and again, imagine yourself in the driver's seat where you have the ability to research, right? That you are a GM. You have people to call and rush and be like, well, I need to find out. Like, I'm not sitting as a fan. You know, you have a month here to figure it out or whatever, a month and a half. So, okay. Like, let's look at it like this. Number one, let me just start off by saying a year ago, Michkov was without a doubt the second best player in this draft. Argu yeah. there, some people were making an argument that he was right up there. It was 1A and 1B, Bedard and Michkov, right? Uh -huh. When the war started, that's when all of a sudden all these questions cropped up. And all of a sudden, you know, I mean, Adam Fantilli had an amazing freshman year with Michigan. Yes. So, you know, maybe it, it, there's validity there that if counts. you want to take Fantilli too over Michkov. Like, I, I won't fault anybody. But, you know, Michkov is right up there with those guys and arguably better than Fantilli. Uh, Offensively. So, so here's my thing. If I'm the GM of the Flyers, Danny Briere, and I'm talking about rebuilds, Right. And he didn't give a timeline on a rebuild. For me, I, I thought that that meant, okay, this could be on the longer side of things. And let's just say, for the sake of this argument, that it could be on the longer side of things. If we're worried about Michkov coming over, his contract, I think, is up when he's 21. Uh, I want to say three years, 20, I believe. Yeah. To like 2025, 2026, right? Uh, okay. So if he's not coming over and in maybe three years, even if it's five years, the Flyers are supposedly going through a rebuild. They're going to be building up their team uh, all while he's over there. I think if he comes over within three years, he'll be 21. If he comes over in five, I'm just throwing a number out. When I say five, he'll be 23. Still a young kid. If the Flyers are doing things the right way, by the time he comes over, they will be adding a superstar because they drafted him at seven which in my mind would be outstanding. If you can get Michkov at seven, you have to take him. Yeah. Because in three years, if you're doing things the right way, you should at least be competitive. You right. should, you know, the guys that you're drafting now and last year should start, they should start to be cracking the roster within the next, you know, two or three seasons. Uh, you add a Michkov and you're, you're adding a star. You're adding a stud is is my argument like why wouldn't you want like that's what we're upset about now the flyers don't have any star talent well you draft them and then in three to three four years if, even if it's five you're adding a star player you have to draft them that's my argument like if you look at it and it's i think that was very well said jim if you look at it and you have ryan lettered and matei michkov and you, and you wow. think well you think this you're not taking again michkov? i don't know what let, let's just say ryan letter has been compared to connecting let's say it's a 40 goal scorer Fine, but Matei okay, Michkov yeah. projects to be a 50 goal scorer. Yeah. It, it's you might as well take the risk based on where the team's at. I look, and Vasily brought this up earlier. You know, his father was obviously, you know, passed away suddenly, found in a river. We don't know what's going on over there. I get the hesitation, but Steve Corniano said it on the show like 12 months ago that this was going to happen. He's like, you just wait. He's like, all of these guys, these foreign guys, he's like, they're all going to drop in the ratings. Like, Every one of the Russian guys, he's like, and they're much better. And where they're going to get picked. So those third round picks that the Flyers have, be ready for Russian players. That's what I say. Hopefully, Flyers are realizing this. Um, but I look at Michkov, what he's doing, it is generational from a paper standpoint. And even if you look at um, Fantilli, his comparison, uh, I've heard as or Bob has it listed as um, uh, Nate McKinnon, right? So Nate McKinnon's amazing. So if you want to do Nate McKinnon or you have a comparison that you know, a guy who's outpacing Ovechkin. Do you want Ove Ovechkin or Nate McKinnon? I don't know. I don't it's know the argument, answer to that. Yeah. But you you understand the impact at least that both players can be to an organization. Yeah, hundred percent. I think. I mean, for the Mitchkov situation, obviously, like Jim was saying. I mean, if you're going to take Fantilia too, he had a heck of a year. So I can't really argue with with that. Mm -hmm. um, but if he isn't going three for me. Like if you're the third team and you don't pick Mitch Cobb, just from a talent perspective, personally, I, I don't understand it. Um, and if the flyers have the opportunity at seven, especially with the fact that who knows how long this is going to be like, why not take the risk? Because you're not going to probably be competitive for the next, you know, few years nonetheless. So it doesn't really hurt you there. And I, I do, I do also think that if you look at the past, right? Like think about when, you know, 
Um, the USSR was still a thing and you had players like Alex McGilney and other type of players defect that situation and come to the NHL. Like it's happened before. So I'm sure like, even if it does take a year or two, like you're going to be able to get this guy over eventually. There's kind of, you know, it's been shown that it can be done. So I, I wouldn't be too concerned from that perspective. Yeah. And, and to, to that point, I mean, Craig Button has Mitch Cobb going to Arizona they're a team that literally doesn't even have an NHL stadium right now. They are in no yeah. rush to get a big name star over there because they can't even fill a 20,000 person stadium with, you know what I mean? If anything, you want to keep him away from your team until you're ready. So I would imagine they definitely would take the risk on him. But, and they also have a, another uh, first round pick a little bit later, I believe. So I don't think that they're in a horrible, yeah, at 12. So they're in a position where they can do that, right? They can take yeah. a Mitch Kov and then go for, Zach Benson, they have listed a twelve. That would be amazing. You know, Arizona It'd be great if the Mitch Flyers Benson. were in that situation, but <laughs> yeah, too bad. <laughs> well, look, I'll say this is I, we're in a much better situation than Arizona. I, I I truly believe that the Arizona Coyotes they are they're not in a good place right now. Um, and the fact that they we're saying what they're saying about them, it's just like I don't want to be Arizona. I think. You know, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I do think that there are the right pieces in place. We can't expect to win Bedard, and that's you know our 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 freedom line that just handed to us. You know, we you know not everybody gets lucky, but I'll say this. Let me ask you, and I'll go with uh, James. I want to ask you about this first. Moving back in this draft, let's say you're capable of getting a second. That's a lot of times. If it's a you know a few steps back, especially. Does it interest you at all at a second? If it's one step, would you do it for a third? You know, if it's, you know, if it's to go to eighth, you know, would you give up on a Ryan Leonard for, you know, uh, maybe, maybe a more, you know, Oliver Moore at eight. I'm not, you know, I'm just throwing it out. Would you be interested in another asset moving back? I don't. Yeah, absolutely. So we were talking about this on our show a little bit last night. And I think the top 10, it goes beyond the top 10. It's just a loaded draft. Like it is the Flyers. I think the Flyers could move back five spots and still get an a outstanding player. player. That so, would get you a second round pick. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. So the scenario that we used, I think last night, we were looking for teams that had late first round picks. I think St. Louis has the 13th overall, and then they have two more further on in the first round. Yeah. They've been hot on Proverov the last couple of years. Um, maybe there's something there. Detroit has, I think, the ninth overall pick, and then they have the 18th overall pick. I don't know. I mean, Steve Eisman, I can't see him, you know, giving up another first round pick to move up two spots, especially since I just mentioned, you know, there's a handful of guys there that you'd be happy to take any of them. But yeah, if, if the, I would, like I said, I would move back as far as five spots to, you know, get an extra asset. Uh, obviously, I would move further down less depending on what asset comes back sure. um but yeah I, I would have no issue doing that i think that's the draft is loaded i mean even so i think my limit would be pick 12 because i think the talent drop off starts to get a little significant okay. but uh, i think that's my limit okay i think that's a fair answer silly yeah. I would say just uh, for moving down, it all depends on the leverage. Like personally, me, I would be open to it, but it's all about the leverage in the trade, right? So like if you have a team below you that really wants to move up because they really love this guy, well, what are you going to do for me? That makes it worth my while, right? So, I mean, if the Flyers can get, um, obviously if they could get somehow like a late first round pick to, you know, move back and another first, that's the ideal. That's probably not going to happen. It's probably going to be more like, you know, a second round pick and you retain, you know, either like the 10th, 9th, 11th, depending what teams are around that range. So I think um, just if you look at where the Flyers are and how deep this draft is and the fact that, you know, we've talked to experts like Steve Cornianos, we got on the show before and he stated there's first um, or first line potential talents in the second round, even as deep as that. Um, I think that, you know, for the flyers, it would be a no brainer, especially if they know that the guy they still want is going to be there. Right. So like, for example, um, let's say a team really covets, I don't know, Will Smith at seven and he drops to their, you know, Ryan Leonard at seven and the flyers want Zach Benson. And he's still around and you can get him at nine. Like, why not make the move, right? So it all depends on the situation. But I think in a draft this deep, um, adding any assets you can is a benefit. So, so, and, oh, go ahead, Jim. Sorry, I was going to say, unless, unless they're like, 
a hundred percent in on like this is our guy and we need this guy. Yeah. yeah. That like if you're not a hundred percent sure that this is the guy you want at seven, you should be open to move him back a, sp- a couple spots. You know, especially what I mean? if you're mixed totally like, and, and your scouting staff, let's say half the guys want this guy and half the staff wants another guy. And that can always happen in a room where there's certain scouts want a certain player. I'm sure so. it does. I'm yeah. sure it does. Yep. Yeah. And so logically I completely agree with you guys, right? Like you have to be open to it. I'm not saying I would close it off, but my head is totally aggression. This draft, I would rather walk away with one player in the entire draft than a series of players. As long as I got exactly the need, like I'm not in the camp with everybody else. I think Danny Breer is giving us lip service, just like Chuck Fletcher is doing it. He's just giving it to us in a better way. That's why when he talks about rebuild, there's nothing specific and there's no dates applied to it. Uh, Sorry. I, I say this all the time. I don't think that there are many ways to go about it. I think there's one way to go about it and it's an iterative process. So it doesn't matter on the dates and all that stuff that you don't, why would you tell anybody any kind of date? That's Fletcher's ridiculous attitude to do that. It's like, you have no idea what you're going to be like next year. So what I would like to some degree, I I hope it doesn't come to this, but like I see two third round picks, I'll give you both third round picks to move up two spots to get the guy that I want in this draft, which if it's divorce, I don't know. Again, I'm no expert on this draft at all. If it's Mitchkov, if it's Dvorsky, if it's Carlson, if it's any of those guys who are in that second tier, you know, or that third tier, sorry, uh, or maybe that second tier, if you want to include Mitchkov, right? If it's any of those big name guys that are a guarantee or at least close to of a top line center, that will make sure that I don't have to worry about that. And I have Cates, I have Frost, I have uh, Couturier, and I don't have to worry about that for the next 10 years. That's the move I'm making. If I can get a Barkov and Carlson or whatever, you know, Backstrom, whatever his comparison is, that's what I'm going for. So I, I would say, yeah, I'd have to be open to it, but I agree that there is that mashup, and that's probably the wise part. And you guys saying that, I do think there's wisdom, but man, do I want to see the Flyers just be like, no, no, we recognize that's the guy. There's our Anze Kopitar. There's the guy. He's not going to be the best player in the league, but we can build around him. I'm going to go get him. And that, that's what I'm hoping from Danny Breer, that that's his playing style is to be aggressive and to be unassumingly aggressive. And I'm hoping that that's what we're going to get in Jim. Maybe that's a little philosophical, but what do you guys think about it? Jim, I'll go, I'll go to you first. No, I mean, yeah. If, if there's a guy that they want, yeah, then do what's necessary to get him. What I want most from this organization is I want to see them make moves with conviction. Like, don't yes. just... Don't flip flop, right? If if you have a guy, yeah. do what it takes to get him, and don't apologize. Have a plan, stick to the plan, essentially type thing. Right, right. Don't don't you know? Don't backslide. Don't don't second guess yourself. If um, if Will Smith is your guy, do what it takes to get Will Smith. If if Dvorsky is your guy, get Dvorsky. Make sure you get Dvorsky. The draft is this draft is too good to not get exactly. your guy. If exactly. if your plan is to move back. Do that. Fine. Don't get right. your guy doing out. that. Yeah. yeah. Don't come out of the draft not doing what you planned on doing because then I think that's a mistake. All of a sudden you're, you know, in plan B. And that's, we've seen plan B too, for too long, I feel like. Yeah. I think that's the thing that the fan like base that. probably wants to see as well, right? Like they want to see a front office that knows, okay, this is the moves that we need to make and we're going to go ahead and kind of do that where, I mean, if you look at the front office, the past handful of years, it hasn't been that way. Right. It's kind of been, well, we we're trying to do this and then there's an excuse as to why we can't do it. Um, so we'll see, like if, if they have the opportunity to move up and um, there's a specific guy that they want and it's not going to like break the bank to move up to get him, I'd say go ahead because it shows convic- conviction in your plan and that, hey, we believe that this kid is going to you know be a star for us. So let's let's grab him and let's put, you know, faith uh, in the fan base and show the fan base that, hey, this is our guy and he's going to be a guy that we plan to build around for a long time right so like put your kind of like stake behind your player um so it'll be interesting i I wonder kind of what the prices are going to be like to move up like i'm i'm guessing the top three to hit the top three will be astronomical i wonder for example you need top five essentially yeah yeah exactly but i wonder for example like let's say you know the flyers are at seven montreal's at five 
somebody's there at five that flies really well, like what's the cost to move up, you know, to five? I, I wonder what that looks like. Like if it's just those two third round picks, like you're saying, or they want even more it, just based on kind of the draft and the talent levels that are going to be around. Right. To, to your point, I think that's what really matters. And it, it matters on what they have as a position and strength as an organization. Right. That's true, they're, yeah. If they're desperate for a center as well, they're going to be like, yeah, we're just, we, we really we want, want that center guy. that you want. Exactly. We want our guy. Right. <laughs> So like I totally understand that. Um, and look, that's something we're gonna have to deal with. I I just really I like the way Jim said that a lot. You know, they did that with like Cam York and stuff. You know, they grabbed their guy, but I would love it to go in the opposite direction where it's like, okay, yeah, they gave up a lot, but again, like we've identified a player as this is a guy who is clear cut in our core in the future. You know, like one hundred percent. We are building around this guy. We invested extra to make sure to get him. And he's not extra, oh, we snuck in a second round pick here. No, we got a, a sure thing, essentially. Like, what does Leo Carlson mean to this organization? Right? Like, I don't know. You know, I don't know exactly how good he is either. Right. I see Dvorsky rising. I see Will Smith rise. I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, so I, I'm interested. I just like the aggression idea. And uh, I like Jim, I like what you said there a lot. Um, identify it and, and move forward with it. Uh, anything else to say there? Otherwise, we'll move on to IIHF. All good. Cool. All right. So let's get in the world. Uh, the worlds that are upcoming. They've kind of started already as the exhibition matches have gotten on their way over the past few days. Three names have been identified uh, of the group to be joining, two of which joining uh, USA and with Ronnie Adderd and Cutter Gauthier, uh, both of the younger players. I believe Cutter is the tied for second youngest in the tournament, or at least one of the, he's in that 19 year old range, which is pretty rare. There's some, a few 18 year olds uh, in this tournament. And then obviously Scott Lawton, the flyers, uh, de facto captain has been uh, added to, um, to Canada's team. And also really excited. Uh, an additional thing to note there as well. Lawton has also been nominated for the King, the King Clancy award for leadership, both on and off the ice. Um, and that's also pretty cool. And to see the guy couldn't even get a C here, but at least the NHL recognizes that he's uh, a captain at heart. So I really appreciate that. So um, also the caveat with uh, Cutter Gote, we should say, we don't know the real news around this, but uh, in today's exhibition game, um, he did take a shot to the head. Um, didn't look great, um, but Dirty we don't elbow. really know. Um, it's going to be precautionary regardless. I don't think anybody's going to be rushing to get him back anyway. Hopefully, it's not a serious head injury, but um, unfortunate there. Uh, Jim, I'll go to you again. Uh, what do you think about the three guys named? And, uh, you know, do you see a level of excitement with Cutter being recognized so early? And then Ronnie Adderd, who um, also, I think, was a little bit of a surprise to get the call. Yeah, I, for sure. Adderd was definitely a surprise. It was great to see him. Uh get the call so early in training camp you know you were there you're even I mean you see this kid and you're like yeah this is a confident kid yes you know, he he's he I, there's i don't want to say it's not an arrogance it's it's not cockiness either he's just he's extremely confident and yeah. you saw for you saw this year for good reason he came in ready to play um had a great year with the phantoms and good for him he's being rewarded playing for the united states uh in in a pretty big tournament uh, as for Cutter Gauthier, had a solid freshman year, a point per game player with Boston College, uh, and it's, all, it's nice to see him, you know, get some recognition. They're playing with NHL talent out there, and you know, any experience for them playing on on this type of stage is is a bonus, in my opinion. You know, bar, barring injury, unfortunately, hopefully Cutter's all right. But uh, yeah, excited for really excited for those two, and then for Scott Lawton. It's also a positive experience. He gets to represent his, his country. He's 28 years old. He slapped an A on him. Good for him. Testament to his leadership. Uh, and he also, I think he was nominated. I don't, I'm don't. i sorry. I don't know if this is one of your topics. Uh, he was nominated for the uh, Clancy King. Memorial Trophy. Yeah, yeah, King Clancy. I did say that within my ramblings. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no worries. Um, so huge day. I mean, big week for Scott Law. And yeah, very excited for these guys and uh, you know, looking forward to watching them. Yeah, dude. yeah, that was well said. Aw Sorry. awesome. Go ahead, uh, said. Jim. I'd say just to jump off with Lawton. I mean, it's his first time representing Canada since the World Juniors, and for him, that's years ago. So probably just a great experience in general to get that opportunity because, as a third line guy, even playing fourth line sometimes coming up for the Flyers, I 
doubt that he thought he was going to get the chance to play for Canada again. Like, probably not. And I think a season like this, where he got to play kind of up in the lineup, almost scored 20 goals, be in a leadership role, it highlights uh, a guy like him to, you know, the, the Canadian team there, and he gets selected. So that's great story for him. And then obviously congrats as well on the King Clancy. I mean, he showed this year... He was essentially, um, as Yurif said, it, you know, the de facto captain, just a, a lot of leadership qualities on the ice. So I think that's a great nomination uh, for the King Clancy there. Um, and for the two younger guys, I think the main caveat with Gautier and Adder is the fact that they're playing with NHL, you know, players on that U.S. team, and they're going to be playing against NHL level competition, playing against men. So just great experience for them in general to develop their game because obviously, as a young player. Um, the easiest way to get accustomed to playing a pro game is to play uh, with other pros and amongst them. So um, that's a great thing for Gautier. I mean, I, I did see the hit. It was a dirty hit um, in terms of the elbow kind of coming across the ice, catch them right in the head like that. Like, unfortunate to see for, for a young guy. Um, I mean, I'm assuming since it's pre-tournament game and there's a few pre-tournament games before it kind of all gets underway here that it's probably precautionary. He'll probably be okay. But I mean, hopefully he's all right. And then I... For Adderd, um, I think just I wouldn't be surprised to see him crack the roster um, next season, right? Like, as you guys are saying, the confidence is there. We know he has the shot. The I think it's now just, too. yeah, exactly. He's, he's of age, age, essentially. I think it's just now proving to Tortorella and staff, like, hey, like, I have the offensive side, I have these abilities. Can I hold my own, you know, defensively? And that kind of cements him there for next season. So I think this tournament will be telling for him. And I'm sure the coaching staff will have eyes on it. And uh, it'll be good experience for him to kind of defend against NHL level guys getting ready for a huge training camp in his career. So overall, I mean, this is aside from the goatee stuff and him, you know, getting that little hit there. It's all great news uh, for the worlds for the Flyers. So, yeah, I think that's really well said. And um yeah, I think Adder 100% will be in that conversation and Zamula will be in that conversation, you know, unless, you know, barring some kind of trade that we don't know about uh, right mm -hmm. now. Um, I think it only makes sense. He's got good size. He's a two-way game. He's a modern defenseman. They've already used him. Um, yeah, it's great to see Adder. I don't want to get ahead of myself with the cutter Gautier injury either. I don't want to assume the worst there. Um, it is obviously typical on the day we, you know, like essentially the day after we miss out on the well, it's hilarious. And our, and our number uh, one press, uh, you know, prospect takes an elbow to the it's head. It's funny because like I was getting off work and I didn't have a chance to really look at social media. And Yuriv, he puts the outline together and sends it over to me. And I'm like, what? Gautier got hit? Like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, of course, after what happened the draft yesterday, that happened, happened too. It happened like, like right around when I sent it to you too. Oh, terrible but uh, hopefully like, he's okay uh, man hopefully he's all right yeah well we'll get we'll give it time um but either way he's not playing for the flyers next year anyway which is you know i will say just a caveat here it's kind of nice that he's being cooked extra long because like to have him come next year after not like like again he was above a point per game player he was great but his team wasn't that great next uh last year i think they're gonna be better this upcoming year especially with ryan leonard joining them yeah. um you know, I expect more production, but I would really love to see him come in like fully mature and like, you know, he gets a head injury here. Like, I don't want to deal with that at the NHL level, you know, when yeah. he's 19, like, let's give him time. Um, and I think that's go kind back, of a nice thing. When a Hobie Baker. Yeah. Hopefully the at least, there yeah, be, be a candidate for it at least, you know? Yeah. I think, I mean, with him being point of game last year, I think definitely has the skill to be a candidate for something like that. I thought that too. I mean, that was something we forgot to mention um, with Leonard, right? Like he's committed to the same school as Cutter. So I wonder if that factors into the Flyers' plan. It might. It might because you could be thinking about, hey, we're like, they're already Developing learning together. to play together. And like, yeah. really, that can be a line left wing, right wing. Though, and correct me if I'm wrong, I did see Leonard play center as well. I just don't yeah. want to convert a guy to be a center again with Cutter. You know what I mean? Like, we got to do it with Cutter, we got to do it with Leonard. Do it with like, Leonard. I, that's so why I said a natural I want, center. Like, I want a true center. Like we don't have that in our org. It, I feel like it's well, so important, especially in the draft too, where they're at that range they're picking. There's going to be a oh, lot the, of centers. Dude, the top so five so. picks or top six picks are essentially no top five are all centers. If you yeah. allow Mitchkov to drop out of the top five, they're all centers. So I'm like, oh, I just want I want one of those. So I could yeah. be wrong here. I, I haven't gone back to look, but I read. I I actually heard this months back but i think i heard ryan leonard was actually a center before he moved to wing and similar to gochier kind of I, yeah he can play the position he, he 
plays it well from what I've what I've seen. But when he was put on a line with Will Smith, obviously Smith is going to play the center, and they moved uh, Leonard out to wing. Yeah, um, we were we were kind of looking at face off percentages. Um, I think it was this past season, and Leonard's face off percentage was significantly lower than Smith's and Perot's. But I mean, you you can work on that. You can get better. Better yeah. at that, but if you if you watch this line play, it's almost like they don't have positions. Like at any, they were kind of crisscrossing and all like covering for each other. It right, makes sense because when you have three guys that are centers playing together, they're all a bit responsible. Dominating, Dude, and, uh, right? And I think that has a lot to do with why they dominate. It's 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 like it. Do you guys watch Ted Lasso? Uh, yeah, at all? I've it's, seen it's the first like, season. All right, if if you've seen the last episode or, or the one of the most recent ones, it's like total hockey, right? Like mm. total football. It's positionless yeah. soccer, but I mean, uh, if if you can get a line, I'm just you know hypothetical. You get a line with let's say Gauthier and Leonard on it. Both guys know how to play center. Both guys both guys know how to play wing. I mean, they can cover for each other. They know where each other's yeah. supposed to be, where they're going to be. Also, um, face off circle, right? You can kind of switch right. guys around well, too. So. Exactly. They exactly will be that. trying one of them at center if they do that. For sure, mm-hmm. um, yeah, hundred percent. Just because we we lack that name in the organization right now, outside of Cutter, who's the only one that who's your big be center prospect, line, yeah, yeah, who potentially can be a top line center, um, or at the very least can be a top line left winger, right? So, and the same thing with Leonard. That's why I just I really want to make sure we go and get the guy, yeah. you know, not like hey, we really like this guy, he's awesome, we can manipulate him, but I'm like, we want the guy we can build around it for sure. Um, all right, so let's move let's move forward here. Let's get into Friedman. Uh, a little bit of news here on the president. So uh, Elliot Friedman um, essentially alludes on his podcast that a decision is imminent for president. Um, I know some names have been going on. I know your your friends, uh, obviously, um, Anthony DeMarco has been uh, – and Jim, I'm sorry. Jim's friend, uh, Anthony DeMarco, has obviously been well into that, and there's new rumors coming out all the time. But there are a bunch of names that have gone out. Just I'll throw out a few. Uh, Kami Granato obviously has come up. Uh, Chris Pronger, Doug Wilson, Ray Shiro, Dave Poulin, Eddie Olchuk. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. Um, obviously, tons of names. My personal number one is Chris Pronger. I'm going to be completely honest. He is who I want e- easily. Him or Doug Wilson. I think Doug Wilson is incredible. So either one of those guys would be amazing. But I've wanted Pronger forever. Um, a guy, if you think about like when the Flyers were in the Stanley Cup, little details like taking the puck, the game puck, to distract the other team. This is a guy who is constantly obsessed with winning, and he will do what he needs to do. He is not afraid of anybody. He is not afraid of the media. He is 10 steps ahead. He has no problem playing games with, you know, with the media and stuff like that. This is not a guy who's going to get rattled at all. And it's a tough position he's about to be in. And I would love Chris Pronger supporting Danny Briere. If it can be Doug Wilson, who I think is kind of like a mastermind GM type of guy, I think also that would be amazing. Those are my top pick. Jim, we'll go to you first. Um, what are you thinking? And I also do think the decision is imminent and needs to happen quick. Now that you know where you're drafting, it's go time. So I do expect the decision maybe even by the end of this week. Jim, what do you think? Yeah, it's, it's it sure sounds like that. Um, I think they have the candidates pretty much down to at least two or three. Mm-hmm. Um, in my opinion, those names are Old Chick, um, Doug Wilson, and if there's a third guy that they're kind of hiding out, maybe it is Pronger. Um, I think it would be down to those three. But uh, I'm really keeping an eye on Old Chick and Wilson here. Um, and I guess the benefits would be is, you know, Wilson's the the hockey guy. He did great things out in San Jose. They were they were like the Flyers West for, for a long competitive time. Competitive for years. So. Yeah, I, making the playoffs every year. Just to add, just to add something, Jim, to that, the stories I've heard about Doug Wilson over the years, I'm not talking about recently, is that this man never lost a negotiation ever. There you go. So, That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Like to have somebody like that in our organization think about what we've lacked over the years, that, yeah. that would be a huge addition. So, uh, absolutely. Uh, so, where I'm a little bit, where I'm, uh, where I'm trying to figure out who would fit the role best is, I'm trying to keep in mind, you know, that Hilferty is going to have these three roles, and I'm talking about president of hockey ops, president of business ops, and general manager of the Philadelphia Flyers, all on an even keel. Like Briere's not so much going to answer to 
whoever the president of hockey ops is, they're all going to answer to Hilferty. Like they're each managing a department, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The responsibilities are split up. And I, I love that because it should make it easier to, to do your job, you know, and you, you should have a constant communication. Everyone's on the same page. Valerie Camillo, lover, respect there. Shouldn't have anything really to do with what happens on the ice, kind of thing. What well, players, yada yada, and and vice versa. 100%. You know, Danny Breer shouldn't have anything to do with promotion, yada yada. Um, so I I love that aspect of it. So when thinking that way, okay, how would Eddie Olchick benefit um, this whole thing? Because I I think what they want from this position, they want them to help fix the cap. They want them to help with marketing. And they want them to help, I think, kind of tie everything together, you know, uh, with the hockey ops. And, I'm sorry, with the, you know, what the Flyers are doing on the ice and, and business side of things. So I'm like, OK, is is that really Doug Wilson? Is that him? Yeah, you know, I'm, maybe like he'll help Danny Briere out a lot. Or, you know, is Eddie Olchek more that guy who's really, you know, known for his personality, coached the Penguins way back when, uh, but he's been in broadcasting for 20 years, a former player, knows everybody. He's got, I'm sure he's got thousands and thousands of contacts. He's in every building, you know, pretty yeah. much every season. Like, uh, I don't really see the downside. He seems like a pretty great guy. He's been through some stuff in his life. He overcame, uh, I think it was, uh, was it colon cancer or prostate yeah. cancer a couple of years back? So, I mean, that... Going through something like that, I, I think can, you know, help change you in a positive way as long as you make it through the other side, God willing. And uh I think he and Briere would get along very well. Uh he's also an outside hire, as, as would Doug Wilson. Um, so I think Olchik would be my guy. I I, I like well him. Said. I just well like said. him as a broadcaster. So to bring him in and be a part of the Flyers organization, if you talk to people in Chicago, they're upset that they lost him. You know, they couldn't sign him to a, they couldn't figure out a contract. They're upset still a year later. Love that. Maybe we'll bring some of that Chicago luck over here. <laughs> they should have brought him in before the lottery. Yeah, Would have yeah. won the draft lottery then. Yeah. But I think, I mean, that was well, said, well Jim. said, Jim. Yeah. Jinx. Um, either way, I mean, I think if you look at it right and, and the way kind of Briere is that green GM here, um, I, I would say it has to be an experienced person. I love Pronger. Um, I love what he brings, love the attitude. I just don't know how much experience he has in that role. So then you have two kind of, you know, green, um, like executives in the GM role and the president of hockey ops role. So I don't know if that's the best course of action for the Flyers, even though I love Pronger and I think you do a great job. Um, for me, I, I lean towards Wilson or Olchuk. I don't really have too much of a preference in either. I just think no matter who they hire in this role has to be somebody who's been around the game, has a lot of experience and somebody that can help Briere and kind of um, be the bridge, obviously between, you know, um, hockey ops and business ops and kind of put it all together as you were saying there, um, Jim. So whether it's old Chuck, whether it's Wilson, I think both are, are great candidates. If those are the two final guys, I think the flyers have pretty much hit the nail on the head with the way they need to go um, and kind of support Briere in this role, because First time GM, you don't want him, you know, left out to dry and not really have somebody that he can lean on who's been in these experiences before. And though, I mean, old Chuck technically hasn't had a lot of management experience the last 20 years. I mean, he's done it all, right? He's been a player. He's been a coach. He's been in management capacity. He's been around the game for all over 40 years at this point so just in general what a hockey mind so i think i mean you can't go wrong there and then with wilson look at the sharks like they've made it to cup finals conference finals been competitive for the last 15 years or so under his um watch so i think just for him to oversee briere and kind of you know the the um job that he would be doing as the gm he would be a big help to him because he's obviously been in a lot of situations that he uh Breer will find himself in in the future so either of those guys would be good i don't know about pronger though i, I love pronger um and and the attitude so i think you know all three could be good i just think they'll probably go for more experience in the end scott melanby is a name we didn't bring up as well i think i think that is very fair about pronger The i give him the same exception that i give to somebody like Breer. Yeah. Without your your performance on the ice and what I've saw you do in the toughest of times and how Chris Pronger is a legend on the ice for a reason is that his mindset is so public to me is that yeah, that's he wants why to win, he gets the exception. Sure. But normally yeah. I do agree. It 
I only make an exception for those rare cases. Just like Danny Briere, I make an exception because of what he did here, how he was brought into the system, what's happened to him in his career. Uh, normally, I want somebody with the best experience. And here's the one thing my buddy said to me, my roommate said this, who's, he is obsessed with all sports. My roommate, Verge, he loves all sports, and he watches every sport, hardcore, everything. He fucking loves sports. And I was talking to him about Boston. And I'm like, why are why are the Celtics so good? Every goddamn year, right? Like every year, you even look at their team. They don't have like Tatum is great, right? But they don't have uh, Embiid winning. You know, they don't have an MVP. It's just like a bunch of good players. And the the immediate thing he said to me is like, dude, he's like, that's a team that's run by basketball people. He's like, they're not run by a corporation like the way the Sixers are, you know. And I thought about that. I was like, that is the problem with the Flyers today is that they used to be run by Ed Snyder. And while he was corporate, he's a hockey fan first. This is a guy who mortgaged his house so the Flyers would be successful. This is not a guy who thought corporate yeah. first. It was a family thing for a reason. If he could have been an athlete, he would have been probably, right? And I look at guys that we've named. The one thing I will say is it's really important that these guys are legit. Right. Hockey because guys. Dan yeah. Hilferty, I appreciate you, but you're not a hockey guy still. You're a hockey fan, which is cool. And that's better. That's a step in the right direction. Valerie Camillo is not a hockey person. Like we need more of that. So that's why I say Chris Pronger because I'm I need a big personality. I mean, that's a great point though. Like if you look at all the most successful organizations in the league, like go look at Colorado right now and their staff in general, like scouts, executives, all that go look at uh, Tampa Bay. It's all guys that used to play in the league. So, I mean, Load they, up you know what I mean? Right. Like guys these. who played sometimes know, I mean, how to build a winning team. So obviously there's situations where it doesn't always work, but I think you're definitely right. Like the flyers I mean, maybe went I mean, too far the other. Friends. Yeah. But I think the flyers maybe went too far the other direction where they kind of need to, you know, get guys that are more familiar um, with, with the hockey side versus the business side. Um, but yeah. Well, don't you think, I mean, Jim mentioned free agency earlier. Like it's a lot different when Danny Briere and Chris Pronger are coming to talk to you about coming to play for the organization than Chuck Fletcher. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything about Chuck Fletcher as a person, but you talk about get, having somebody's respect yeah. right off the bat. Like, like you, you can literally say like, you know, what kind of player. Well, think I about it. I mean, if look you, at what kind of team I'm trying to yeah. build. Yeah, but think about it. Like, if you're a former player, and let's say you know you grew up watching a guy like Prong or Briere, think about their level of respect that's going to come into your mind in this situation if you know they're trying to recruit you, right? So obviously, there's something. I mean, there's a factor to that. You can't there, you can't deny it. So there's a reason we're watching. And Jim, we bring this up on this podcast all the time. There's a reason we're watching. Majority of like a lot of the best teams in the league are run by ex players. You know, Cam Neely. Right, Joe Sakic, Steve Eiserman obviously built Tampa Bay. It's not the only Bill way Garen, to go about yeah. it. It's not the yeah. only way to do it, but it's obviously a highly effective way. So, right. I and, I agree oh, with ahead, it. Please. Sorry, I I agree with it. So, like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. You you guys watch The Office at all? Yes. Of yeah, course. of course. So, Several like, times Michael, over. Michael Scott, paper guy. You know they they didn't get the promotion. They bring in a a, a guy that was. Uh, Steel was what he did before pay, uh, the paper company, right? And he, yep. nobody, nobody ended up liking oh, yeah. him in the end because he wasn't a paper guy. Yeah. Um, so it's like if you if you so if you're running a restaurant, you you're not going to bring in somebody from I don't know a, a lumber company to run the restaurant. You're going to bring in a Great guy analogy. that has, has restaurant and you know experience in the restaurant. So it's the same thing. I mean, the, you want guys that have been around the game that understand, obviously you want them to have certain qualities, right? You want, you're not just going to hire any Joe Schmo that played hockey. Um, so yeah, I mean, all this, you know, bring in outside people stuff. It, I, it makes sense. And Joe Sackick, Steve Eiserman, these guys, they were good, good players and they're good general managers. So the, I like it. The, the, and I love what you just said there and the impact that what they've done, like if you think about them as a player, a Joe Sackick, Chris Pronger, Brendan Shanahan, any any one of these guys, right, that are now associated with these kind of like teams that are building up around the league, they had the same reputation to the teams they played on. And I look at Chris Pronger, who was plus 35 years old. When we lost him, our defense fell apart. This team took an immense, like culturally, he was an immense impact immediately. Yeah. Locker room, all that stuff. Right? Yeah, and that's why I want that guy. Like, even Mike Richards, I don't even understand it. 
what kind of voodoo that guy was playing. But there are certain <laughs> guys, you know, they go to organizations and they lift Tom Brady. He goes to an organization and he lifts them up. And if you can bring guys like that into your organization with that mindset that they have, Tortorella, right? Tortorella is like that. He's a humongous personality. Like we need that. We need that, especially right now, because we don't have that reputation um, and we need to build that. And I think, I think all of the guys you mentioned, I think Eddie Olchick, I think he did a great job, Jim, of kind of selling him even to me. Cause like when you said, I'm like, yeah, you know what? He is really savvy. He's been around for so many years. It's like, yeah, it would be really cool. We'd have a lot of respect immediately. Nope. We need somebody that isn't going to get questioned on a regular basis either. You know, we need somebody who's going to be like, that guy knows a little bit better than me. You know, we need more of that, um, at least in the beginning here, you know, before something bad happens. Yeah, I think a guy like Old Chick, uh, you know, he's a nice guy, but a guy that should also be respected. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I was going to say demands respect just based on like his tenure and length in the sport, right? Yeah. Right. And you kind of need, in my opinion, you know, the best leaders – they know how to be both, you know, yeah. they're good people, people, but they also, you know, if you, you can't cross that line with them. And I think, I hope Briere can be that guy. We saw it on the ice. If you ever talk to this guy or, I mean, you watch him in interviews or, and whatnot. Nicest sweet, guy ever. The sweetest guy you're ever going to see. <laughs> yeah. But, go in the corner with him and see what happens. Right. Yeah. We watched him play <laughs> this guy. He's got the killer instinct in him. And I, I love that about him. So I'm hoping he that he can be the same as a GM. I'm, I'm really excited. Well, we've kind of, we've kind of said on the past, right? Like a lot of teams, they exude, you know, energy from the top down. And I think Briere kind of brings that winning mentality that I think the Flyers were really lacking with Fletcher. Unassuming. Uh, he brought, brought the same hunger there. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm assuming hunger and determination, and yeah, he's got a killer mentality. And th again, that's why I'm like, I, I'm like fantasizing about adding another guy with a killer mentality. I'm like, let's go! I was like, you have the three of them, and then Tortorella is yelling at everybody. Like, can you imagine a room full of like, I'm just saying, even Chris Pronger and Tortorella together, what and what, what those up. conversations would be like, even you know, um, like around imagine being a fly on a wall there. Oh my god, it'd be so much fun. <laughs> Um. Yeah. No, I think that's all well said, and uh, I'd be happy with anybody uh, that we just named. Let's let's put it that any one of those three. Um, my gut tells me it's going to be Tom uh, Wilson. Or Tom Wilson. Doug Wilson in the end. <laughs> that would be sick too. Yeah, that'd be cool. I would love him. Um, but you know that, and let's get right into it because these playoffs. You know, I I, I want to use this to transition a team's attitude, the way they play. I'm going to say this now because, and Jimmy, you're not on this show, obviously, regularly. I make fun of the high-end talent comment a lot. I know people probably don't like that, but I don't really agree with anybody that you're required to have this like high-end talent to be a Stanley Cup contender. I think you need to you need that to win a Stanley Cup. I think the Stanley Cup winners are the ones that are separated. Like I don't see Seattle winning a Stanley Cup I, personally. I think they can they can make a great run here, but just like Vegas, who made it to the finals, they lost to the team that had the superior talent. But if you have if you have a team that can play well together, you know you can do a lot of awesome stuff, and you don't have to have the best players in the league to do it. You have to have a good team and a full team of good players, and that's what and we'll start with the first series here. That's what Seattle has is they don't have any bad players, and in the time where you really just have to play competently, aggressive. You know, do all the little things right and play playoff hockey, which um, is a different style of hockey than the regular season hockey, as we all know. Um, you can find success, and Seattle now leads uh, their series 2-1, winning the last game 7-2 against Dallas, who obviously was the favorite coming in here. Um, I would say my pick from the West initially when this started. And now, you know, I don't think it's over for Dallas, but I would definitely be worried. I mean, Seattle has looked good, and they don't seem to be slowing down any kind of way. Um, so what do we think? Who, who do we think is walking away with the lead? I'll say in this case, I'll still take Dallas in seven, but I'm getting nervous. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, Jim, I'll go to you first again. Cause you're our guest. What do you think? Yeah, I'm there too. So I had Dallas going to the Stanley cup on the Western side, but I find myself like when I'm get when I'm getting to, uh, ready to watch these games, I'm betting on Seattle. Three, yeah. I bet them three times, and I, really? they play three times, right? Because they're always the over. That's yeah. why, right? So yeah, you so got like, some I'm, nice payouts there, Jim. I'm taking them, and uh, yeah, it's it's weird, like because I did pick Dallas, but I find myself almost rooting for Seattle. Mm -hmm. Fun to watch an underdog. It's really weird, yeah. Uh, and as much as I I, I like watching Ottinger play, and I'm a big uh, Pavelski guy. 
there's just something about Dallas this year where I'm just like, they're not, they're not much fun to watch. Whereas mm -hmm. Seattle, I think uh, I'm really enjoying watching them is, is why I want them to win. I think. Yeah. So I had devil or not devils. <laughs> I had Dallas. Um, I believe in six in this series. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's going to happen that way. I'll still stick with Dallas and seven. Um, for Seattle, like, I just think their team, and if you watch them during the season too, like, they just come at you in waves and waves and waves, and they're so fast. Like, they're one of the fastest teams I think I've, I've ever seen, to be honest. Like, just in general, like, their whole team, they just have speedy guys on every line, and they just have a lot of depth. Like, you can't look at one line and say, oh, okay, that's the fourth line. You know what I mean? And when you have a team built that way in the playoffs, what usually helps with winning is depth. So yeah. I think it's a recipe for success for them. And it's been a great series. I think they're a ton of fun to watch. And I mean, Grubauer's bounced back. Um, I still think Dallas takes it because I, I really love Ottinger, but it, it'll be close. I wouldn't be surprised if Seattle comes out with it. Yeah. De depth win championships, superstars separate you from the pact. So yeah. if you can, if you have like Seattle, I mean, Talk about a, a free agency destination yeah. for a top player around the league who goes, man, they're this good without a player like me. If, I, if I'm added to that group, all of a sudden, you know, I'm their yep. goal scoring where they do everything else right. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, cool. All right. So we'll, we'll go through that series. Let's stay on the West. Um, we have a series that I think, um, I think is a lot harder to predict. Then the other series, I did have Vegas going, I think, in seven. Um, but Edmonton, with their superstar, should not be underestimated. Vegas does have the lead. They did win handedly um, in game three. But, you know, the Oilers looked dominant in game two. Um, obviously, you know, Vegas wins that first game. Jim, we'll go to you first again. How do you see this kind of playing out with, uh, you know, I would say maybe powerhouses in the West to some degree? So I have Edmonton winning the series. I I, okay. I just want to see fun. So I have two sides here. On one hand, I want to see fun, which is McDavid and Dry Seidel, sure. you know, moving on to the conference finals again. Dry is just playing out of his mind. Obviously, Connor McDavid's the best player in the world. On the other hand, I want to see all the teams with no state income tax <laughs> in the final four, which would be Seattle, Vegas. Yeah. Uh, Florida, I'm sorry. So it can't be four. It would be three out of four. So um, <laughs> so I, I did pick Edmonton, but I, I won't be upset if, if Vegas goes on and wins that. That's hilarious. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's a good pick. I mean, I had uh, I had Vegas um, in seven. For me, it's just Edmonton's goaltending. I said it last round. I thought they were going to lose last round to the Kings because I don't trust Skinner. And I mean, he wasn't very good the other night. I wonder if they try to get Campbell in there. I know they, they threw him in. I wonder if they go back to Skinner or they go with Campbell. It'll be interesting. I just I don't trust the Oilers' goaltending. Um, I mean, I don't really trust Vegas' goaltending either with Brassois and that. So it's an interesting thing. Me, me as a guy who played Nat, I'm always the goalie guy. So I always like kind of, for playoffs, go with, okay, who's the better goalie? That's who's going to take the win. That's my logic. But I think Vegas, I think Brassois is doing a better job in Nat than uh, Skinner has been. So I'll, I'll stick with Vegas there. All right. Uh, I will stick with Vegas in seven. I do kind of agree with you, Jim, that it would be fun. Uh, I do think Edmonton is on its way up. If they don't make it this year, I do think next year they should. They were going to be one of the most dangerous teams in the league. It's about time. You know, they're building it right. I think they're doing good things there. I just think Vegas's lineup is just stronger, top top to yeah, bottom, yeah, and the addition of, of Eichel is a game changer for them. They have a legit number one center, one that's been recovering and it's going to get better, you know, as time goes on here. Um, and he had a big night the other night. So it's like, you know, I think it's kind of nice poetic justice for Eichel, you know, if he beats McDavid. I think that's a fun story too, after yeah, not getting the respect, having the injury, being on a team it didn't work out with. And, you know, it's, you know, nobody talks about Jack Eichel. They don't talk about him like Austin Matthews and the other top guys anymore. Um, and he really should be in that conversation. So I, I you know, I think that's fun too. Um, so yeah, but we all agree seven game series is a tight, tight playoffs. All right, let's go to, um, the most divisive one. Um, not, not divisive, but I guess more, 
I don't know, the craziest one. Florida up three, nothing in a series to Toronto. Uh, Vasily, you're in Toronto. I'll go to you first since you're close on the ground and you can tell us um, how the city Wait, feels. Just pop out my window and <laughs> let you know I know what's yeah. happening here. Down three, nothing. Uh, all I, I think all close games, I believe. Maybe maybe Florida won one big, but uh, none of the stars uh, star players have scored in the second round. Toronto definitely, you know, coming in limp here and not looking good enough to get past the second round. Um, they have an opportunity still, obviously, to survive. There have only been four teams, one of which are the Flyers, to ever do this, um, to come back down from 3 nothing. Uh, I will say this. Um, I don't think Florida is that good of a team that they couldn't lose three games in a row, the same way Toronto lost three games in a row. But the way that they've been on a heater, it doesn't seem likely. Um, but it's definitely possible, you know, that they extend the series. Um, I will take Florida. I, I had the... I had the Leafs in seven, but it's hard for me not to take, uh, you know, I don't know, Florida in five. You know, give- Okay, I, I had uh, Leafs in seven as well. I mean, I'm going to go Florida with the brooms. I think they're going to sweep tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I don't think the Leafs have a chance, unfortunately. Just, oh, I mean, it's been it's been close, obviously. It's a 4-2 for the first game, 3-2 Florida win in the second game, overtime loss for the Leafs in the third game. I just think... Um, In a series and in the playoffs, it's all up to your top guys. And look at the Panthers and look at what their top guys of Barkov, Kachuk. Kachuk's looking like the best player in the world right now. Yeah, Yeah. right? Like, look what these top guys are doing. And then go to the Leafs side and look what you're paying with Matthews, you know, 11 million, Marner, 10 million, Tavares. They're not doing much. I'd say O'Reilly has probably been the most effective of the big guys for them. So I think the Leafs go as their stars go, right? If these guys wake up, We'll see the series go longer. If they don't, you're going to see it end quick. And I will caveat as well that, I mean, Bobrovsky's locked in, and when he's playing like this, he's a hard goalie to beat. And it's looking like he's on his A game right now. So I, I don't see the Leafs coming back. I, I think the, the Panthers have the brooms out, and it's going to be hilarious to see Toronto win their first series in 20 years just to not win a game in the second round. So we'll see how it goes for them. But Fair yeah. enough. What do you think? What do you think, Jim? Yeah, it, it... In a way, I feel bad, but also it's like it's kind of funny. A little it bit. is pretty funny. Um, you know, you had the Leafs fans chain, and we won Florida, and I feel like that always, that almost always backfires when you do oh, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh man, Florida are just coming together at the right time. I don't. I'm not even sure it's so much they're the better team, but I think they got they're clicking. Hot. Yeah, they. I mean, they, you hear a lot of their players. They've been playing playoff hockey since January, and uh, when they when when they got to the playoffs, it was business as usual. I picked Florida in six before the series started. Just kind of did I think it was going to go like this? No, I thought it was you know back and forth two two three two four two something like that. But I had Florida winning the series. I I just wasn't impressed with the Leafs beating. Tampa Bay, the ways that they won, they didn't. I look... thought Tampa outplayed them a lot of the games that they yeah. did win. So <laughs> they were they were very they were they were unimpressive, you know. And Tampa was kind of weaker this year than they have been in the past. Um, I I was wondering if the emotional high of finally getting past that first round was gonna, you know, maybe That's deflate the Leafs yeah. a little bit. Like, oh, okay, we would... did it. I, I will say, awesome. as being somebody in Toronto, it got celebrated like they won the cup. I mean, the right. Leafs ordered three cases or not ordered but i think they got three cases of bud light delivered to their dressing room after a first round win so like i don't know it's a little excessive it's only round one but right uh, so who else do we have in the i mean you look at a team like carolina they win round one it's business as usual like yep. when you win a round it's supposed to be like okay well we got past the first now we got now three more to, to the next team it's not like <laughs> okay guys let's celebrate it's you know that, yeah. that's what i think maybe was missing here was someone to say hey we didn't accomplish anything here. Well, All we did was get past the first round. I will say I, that was Matthew's response. It, when I did see his media interview, it was kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Like he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't excited, but you can see he didn't show up in this round. And like, look, I'll eat my words. You know, I think we all will if they, if they even rallied two games in a row. Oh, I yeah. I think a I'll, lot of people will give I'll eat my words too. Toronto more credit. If it's led by their best players and they're like, all right, maybe it took them a little bit. You know what I mean? You just I think haven't can... seen pushback. Like they're pay- they're paying so That's much money the for these top guys. You want to see them respond, and they haven't really done that. Yeah, so. and and quite frankly, you know, there there might be a good trade in there. Like 
you know, maybe you do trade Mitch Marner for a, a different top player around the league, you know, maybe a centerman. I don't, I don't know. Right. Maybe you do move Tavares for a different uh, type of veteran. I, you know, I don't know. I'm just saying, um, Sometimes it's going to be, takes. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Um, well, good luck to the Leafs. Um, they're going to need it. Uh, and let's go to our final series. And this one, um, I will caveat it with the updated score. So right now the Carolina Hur- Hurricanes are up 2-1 in the series against the um, the very young New Jersey Devils. I was a little surprised they got past the first round, not based on talent, but I don't believe this is a young man's game. I also make fun of that statement quite often. Show me a young team that's won a Stanley Cup. Can't find them. Uh, this, so the Devils, while they are more talented, they are great. I'm not more talented. They're a very talented team. And they're definitely built, especially with Hughes coming. Um, and just the, the fact that they have so much talent. Uh, the name of the other defense is escaping me right now. That they Nemich. Draft. Nemich thank you. Yeah. Ne- Nemich coming. Like this team is built to compete for a while. And it's going to be annoying. Um, but they are due down 2 one to the Hurricanes, who I think are coming out of the East. I mean, they look so good. Um, and then tonight they're up 5-1 in oh. the second period against New Jersey, putting in four in the second. Um, Hughes got the lone goal for New Jersey. Probably that game is gone. Um, and Carolina, you know, despite Devils putting up eight, even though giving up three shorthanded goals, I think yeah. it was in that game. They're not <laughs> playing great defense. Um you know, they still gave up four goals, but a game where Carolina kind of just, you know, got it right back together. And I think now that Boston's out, Hurricanes are the scariest team uh, in in the East and maybe the cup favorites at this point uh, with Boston being out. So I will take the Hurricanes uh, in six. Let's give the Devils uh, some credit because um, I, I do think they're a good team, but I do take the Hurricanes. Um, and it could be five for all we know, the, the way the Hurricanes play. Jim, I'll go to you first and then Vasily obviously chime in. Go ahead. So how how incredible is it right now that the Hurricanes are doing this? They they scored five goals and I'm sorry, four goals without, in five minutes tonight. Yeah, without Svacha and Patch. So. Yes. Yeah, and and Terravine too. Yeah, oh yeah, Terravine as well. Oh forgot God. broke his hand. Yeah. So that's three top six players, and they're doing this to New Jersey. I, I didn't see this happening. I thought this was going to be a long, hard fought series, and I was I was Great point literally about to pick New Jersey, even down three to one. And as I'm getting the DraftKings app up. It's all of a sudden five once. Like, hey, thank God I didn't do that. Yeah. Um, but Carolina is looking scary right now. Nekish with two goals tonight. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nature Nate, Nate has been playing great the whole playoffs. Like he's on, he's hit another level. I think um, for Carolina, it's crazy because it just shows like that system and whatever Brenda Moore is kind of preaching. They're, it's just next man up, and they're kind of just rolling the same same style of play. Of the right? They're a better well, yeah, version but, of the Kraken. Well, yeah, but it's it's literally the same style of play. It hasn't changed. You lose three top six forwards, and what are they doing? They're overwhelming you with the it, forecheck and possessing the puck the whole game the same way they've been doing. So it's just crazy that they're not really changing. I, and I think it all starts with the defense. Like their their defense is stacked. Like they have, I would argue their bottom pair could be like a second pair on, on most teams. Um, so I, I mean, I had Carolina in seven. I didn't think it was going to be this much of a, you know, one-sided affair, but I think definitely they're going to take it in five now, just the way it's going. Crazy. I, I will say this. I do believe that what Tortorella is doing here. I, and Jim, I don't know if you agree with this. Cause this is something I've said on this podcast. I don't think the flyers are good enough to win anything, but the way that they were playing and especially at times where they just didn't have the talent this year to really compete. He is, they are playing a brand of playoff hockey. He is teaching them to play playoff hockey. You can see what makes these other teams successful, the relentless for checking the shot blocking, which the flyers were at the top of the league. Just we're an annoying team. We, we overplay our cover. We overplay our talent. That is what these teams are doing in the NHL. And it's like, that's what I want to see. So when I see the you know Carolina doing this, and even Florida to some degree, even though they have talent too, but they're outplaying you know the what they have on paper. It's like that is what's key to kind of winning. And I feel like the Hurricanes are just I don't know. They look really good, and it makes me happy to see that we are at least a little bit trending in that direction where you're seeing guys you didn't expect to be star players all of a sudden having moments playing like star players, like you know like Tippett, Frost. All these guys that people thought were broken, all of a sudden they're not broken, you know? Um, I don't know if you agree with that at all, Jim. No, so I like what you just said right there because uh, a guy like Tip, like the Flyers couldn't develop, right? That that was yeah. the whole thing for the longest time. They can't develop, yada, yada. All of a sudden, 
they get a guy like Tippett in a trade who was a reclamation project. Like, let's call it yes. what it is. He wasn't panning yeah. out in Florida. Comes to Philadelphia. You know, he looked okay last year. This year, almost a 30-goal scorer. Like, they did it. They fixed Owen Tippett. They made him into some he, – he said it himself. You know, he realized what kind of player he needs to be in the NHL. And I, I, I think, think Torts what, helps with that for sure. Exactly that. And, and once you realize what you can be, what you need to be, you have confidence all of a sudden. And with athletes, confidence is everything, okay. right? And if you can inspire confidence in your players, you can turn a kid around. You can These are kids. You could turn them around. Morgan Frost, you know, maybe he did it in a different way. But uh, so – I don't want to get ahead of myself or put unrealistic expectations on Morgan Frost, but you know, you guys are you were talking about Marty Nietzsche right there. Yeah. Why can't Morgan Frost be that next year? Why can't he have a, a Marty Nietzsche? I mean, type that's a great next season? question. I could totally. I just with the skills there, it's all what you kind of alluded to, right? It's the confidence, and even mm-hmm. Frost kind of said it in his interview with Nasty Knuckles when he's playing confident. Um, you know, he just plays freely, doesn't think so much. And that's when he can really be effective. And I think in hockey in general, it's a really fast game when you're in your head and you're thinking a lot, a lot of the times it doesn't work out, right? It's a lot of instinct, instinctual play and just feeding off kind of the adrenaline and knowing that, Hey, like I can make these plays and I'm going to make them. So exactly, exactly. A lot of it needs to be habit. It needs to be just drilled into your mind. Like when I'm here, when the puck's here, it's got to go here. When the puck's there, I got to be there. And when everybody knows where everyone's going to be kind of thing, now you have synergy, you know what I mean? And uh, that's what's lacked for the flyers for so long as you can see it. Like they, they're They're getting back to the five man unit type of play where I think that's what you need to be successful. Look at the playoffs, look at Carolina, right? How do they play in every shift? They're five man. I think you need that above everything, above everything. Um, and and that's why we have problems with Sanheim and like all these guys that really shouldn't be a problem. It's like, Oh, we want to throw guys out of town. It's like, maybe our whole system here is broken and guys are not individually succeeding where, you, you know, you, you know, you look at Carolina, you throw Tony D'Angelo there, not a problem, career year for him. But you throw him here, it's like, oh, he's not a good enough defenseman. I, I was joking around. What, how did we not know this? And I talked about with Goss this We knew that he's an offensive defenseman. They're not good at defense. There are no offensive defensemen in the league yeah. that are good at defense outside of the top two, which are what? McCarr, who's not the best at defense, and Eric Carlson, who's also not the best at defense. It's like there are no off pure offensive defensemen that are great at defense. They, they don't exist in the league. You know, we threw out Shane Gossip. It's like it's the same shit every time. So I don't really like buy any of this stuff. I want to see you get the most out of what you have. And I do think Tortorella is doing that. Um, I think there's changes coming. You know, I don't think this team is built to win a cup or anything like that, but there's more to be had here. And I think it starts with just playing. It sounds annoying probably to people, the right brand of hockey. And, you know, we were talking about a rebuild. Where's the rebuild in Seattle? Where's the rebuild in Vegas? Where's the rebuild in New York? I, I, I heard, I love Russ Cohen, but like, come on, five years. I don't care about that number. It's not real. These numbers are not real. They're arbitrary. They're thrown out. First of all, context matters for each one of these dates. And if you look at the Flyers roster, you can say five years to me, but I can also make an argument that could happen in two years. I can also make an argument that happens in 10 years if, any, if anything fails. So like, I just don't like any of these numbers thrown around. That's why it's like, I don't really care what Danny Breyer said. It's a wait and see situation. So, well, sh- show me what they do. What they yeah. do next will reveal what they think the timeline is. If you're getting rid of Provorov, if you're getting rid of Sanheim, if you're getting rid of TK, if you're getting rid of these mid-20 guys, you think you're in it for a long haul here, like what Chicago did. If you're getting rid of Hayes, if you're getting rid of guys who are around 30 years old, you think, hey, in a couple years, we should be competitive again. So that's how I kind of see it. Yeah, um, it's all wait and see, really. We got to see what everything. moves kind of Breer can make first, right? I'm excited to see him get going. That's why I want this decision made. And like, I'm playing NHL. I want some of these guys. I want to know who's gone already. You know, like <laughs> if Kevin Hayes yeah. is gone, I want to know. You know, if he's here, I want to know. It's going to take a while, but all right. Let's get ready. Wrap this up. Jim, um, thank you so much again for joining. Anything you want to leave our audience with? Again, we told them where to follow you, but anything coming up? Anything you want to make people aware of? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's always fun always. hanging out with you guys. Good seeing you. Always. Um, yeah, as far as promoting hwhockey.net, follow me on Twitter at J-I-M-I-K-E-H-W. Uh, we're going to be recording a show with uh, former Flyer Zach Ronaldo this weekend. I think that show will release probably Monday. 
Fantastic. But looking forward to that one. So keep an eye out for that. Awesome. Vasily. Oh, uh, yeah. Awesome stuff. I'm excited for that Ronaldo episode. I got to check it out, Jim. But uh, in terms of uh, Flyers Nitty stuff, um, articles coming throughout the off season. So just keep an eye, everybody, on, on the website there. And con- I, I mean, we appreciate all the support. We see our numbers going up um, in terms of the podcast. So just continue to like, subscribe, share everybody. And thanks for, you know, sticking along throughout the long uh, off season here. So Yeah, well said. And again, Jim, thank you so much for joining. This was a really fun episode. I love shooting the shit about this stuff. Um, yeah, it was. yeah, man, this is good stuff. So again, thank you everybody for listening. Please like, subscribe, share, give us a rating on iTunes, um, Spotify, wherever you can listen to us. We're probably everywhere. But anything you guys can do, even comments, all very welcome support. Um, it means a lot to us and it definitely, definitely helps grow our channel and our brand and everything like that. So thank you again. Um, again, we love you and remember, always stay great.